Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced at North Idaho College on the shores of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator political scientist Tony Stewart in welcoming today's guest. Each year we have a two-part series. It's our annual review of books and we're so delighted to do that. And, and my colleagues at North Idaho College on the faculty come and are so generous to share with us their reading from the previous summer. On today's program we're going to do a review of outstanding books of fiction that they have read this past summer. And I'm so delighted to have four of my outstanding colleagues at North Idaho College uh, and I would like to introduce them and then we'll start uh, dealing with those books. First of all is Denise Clark. Uh, Denise has been with us each year that we've done this and she's an outstanding um, reader and uh, I, on all the years I've been here I've been able to go to her over and over and, and find out about so many books and Denise Clark is a librarian at North Idaho College and Denise welcome back for another year. Oh, thank you Tony, pleasure to be here. I'm also so pleased to welcome Dr. Virginia Tinsley Johnson and Dr. Johnson chairs the uh, communication and fine arts department and her field is English and she's been a colleague for my uh, 34 years here and uh, she too is so highly articulate in the field and so uh, welcome and it's nice to have you again on the program. Thanks very much Tony, my pleasure. Another one of my great colleagues and friends is Fran Barr who's from the English department and she too is a very very voracious reader and uh, we're so delighted to have you to join us in this annual program that we do. Thanks Tony. And, and, and our fourth one is Annie McKinley, who is also in the speech department, and Annie's with us every year, and welcome back for another year, and I know you read extensively, and you're so delightful to have you on the program. With that, we'll get right into fiction, and so I'm going to start with Dr. Virginia uh, Johnson and tell us about uh, your summer reading, and I know she brought uh, a number of books in the field of fiction. And, <laughs> Yes. And uh, we share with them why you thought they were so exciting. Oh, well, it's so hard to choose. And um, we've had a great time swapping titles even before the show started. But I'm going to start with the book that I just finished, which I just think is terrific. It's called The Speckled Monster, a historical tale of battling smallpox by Jennifer Lee Carroll. And I have just learned so much from this book about the fact that William Jenner is not the person who really started the battle against smallpox. In fact, um, it was begun in England, really, um, by Lady uh, Mary, Mary uh, I'm going to say actually that's not wrong, Wortley Montague, who was uh, a member of the aristocracy and whose husband was the uh, English ambassador to Turkey. So one of her concerns was learning in Turkey about these beautiful women who were in the Turkish baths who had no smallpox scars. And she learned that that was because they'd already invented inoculation there. Uh, the other was an American doctor um, whose uh, experience was through the slave trade, and he discovered all these slaves who came from Africa hadn't uh, any problem with smallpox either because they also knew about inoculation. And so the two of them are the focal points of this book about smallpox. I learned that uh, Cotton Mather was really instrumental in producing uh, a lot of followers for smallpox, but it was a really controversial battle because there were uh, political uh, movements afoot to stop any kind of experimentation with smallpox. We've seen that in recent times. Too. Oh, absolutely. How, how about a couple of other books? Okay, the others that I read, of course, I had to go to the bestsellers, and I read The Da Vinci Code by Dan Brown, which was really a page turner, and um, I had no idea what I was getting into, but the whole notion that Da Vinci had some other views of who uh, might be the uh, might be Christ's disciples, including the role of Mary Magdalene and some of his paintings and what was depicted there. I had to go back and look at the Last Supper again because of the ideas introduced there. So I really thought that was a wonderful book. It's almost like you might just a hold one, it up if you don't one, mind. So um, I'm not sure right, which camera. Right okay, here, yeah. um, I'm not sure uh, if it took me one or two sittings. Probably two because my eyes probably went out on me. But um, mm -hmm. I finished that one in a hurry because I kept wanting to know how it was going to yes. turn out. So yeah, those two are really uh, a couple that I would push. Um, one that we are all swapping stories about is this book, The Secret Life of Bees, which is just a delightful story about a little girl who's a, sort of a character who encounters the issues of racism and actually some child abuse on the part of her father and uh, searching for her mother and the roots and discovering a picture of a, a place where 
people make honey and tracking that down and finding out what role that had in her mother's life and her own. It's just a beautifully written novel. And that's Sue Monk. That's Sue good. Monk Kid is the author's name. Denise, we'll go to you and we'll hope we have time to have more than one round, but uh, tell us about two or three of your favorite books this summer. Um, unfortunately, none of these are in paperback yet. These are brand new, off the press. Um, the first one I'd like to talk about is one called The Known World by Edward P. Jones. And I believe <laughs> this is an award winner. <laughs> I'm waiting to see if this takes any kind of literary prizes because this is absolutely one of the most, uh, this is one of the best written and most intriguing novels I've read in ages. And I would like to read just a little bit from the uh, jacket in the book to kind of give you an, an overview of the flavor, uh, the, the novel's flavor. An ambitious, luminously written novel that ranges seamlessly between the past and the future and back again to the present. And when um, this um, writer said luminously written, um, that is absolutely true. Um, the known world weaves together the lives of freed and enslaved blacks, whites, and Indians and allows all of us a deeper understanding of the enduring, multi-dimensional world created by the institution of slavery. And I think this is one of the reasons I found this book so intriguing, is because some of the protagonists in this novel are freed blacks who own slaves. Now, you know, so there is, um, and the, the relationships, there are, <laughs> there's a host of characters in this novel. And the complexity of relationships that the, the author uh, portrays among freed and slave and, slave and um, Indians who are also American Indians who are also treated as slaves, uh, the white and, and a few white characters. I mean, all of it, it's, very, it's a very complex institution that, of slavery that this author writes about. And so I cannot uh, recommend this one too highly. And even though you're talking about a novel in, in our book dealing with fiction, yet so many novels are based upon really f the facts of what happened in the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, the author, Edward P. Jones is the author's name, and he is an African American. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, he has just one collection of short stories that uh, I believe was a finalist for the National Book Award, his collection oh, yeah. of short stories. And so this is his first, uh, his next work after that. And it is a very impressive debut for Thank a novel. You. How about another book? Uh, now for some fun reading. Um, for I've those of you, that, that, uh, <laughs> actually, you wonderful people read a lot of things fun. very serious. This too. is a, yes, this is a serious novel. Um, but if if you want a novel that you can sit down and read in an evening, uh, Maisie Dobbs by Jacqueline Winspear is one that I highly recommend. Um, this is a novel, a sleuthing novel, and Maisie Dobbs is a product of the British lower classes right before World War I. Um, she is a very bright young woman, but her father's a fishmonger or something, I think, works in the market, fish markets of London. And she becomes, she hires out as a, a maidservant in a wealthy aristocrat's home. Um, Lady Rowan, I believe her name is. And Lady Rowan takes her under her wing. Lady Rowan is an early suffrage, a suffragette in, in Britain, and recognizes Maisie's intelligence, sends her to school, educates her, and um, she becomes the protege of Lady Rowan's French um, a friend who is a, a psychiatrist, psychologist, and also an investigator who trains Maisie. But there's a, a lot about Maisie uh, drops out of college and becomes a nurse in World War I. So there are a lot of scenes in here about the experiences of nurses in World War I. So it's a very, it's an entertaining novel as well as being, you know, a great introduction to some of the experiences of trench warfare and the horror of that. You know. Thank you. Yeah. Fran, let's come over to you now. Okay. Um, I, I think it's interesting we're all writing down <laughs> the names of books as fast <laughs> as we can because this is a wonderful opportunity for us just to, to get together and, and hear each other's uh, summer reading lists. 
Um, unfortunately, my book does not have a cover on it, but um, it is a book that Annie, next to me, recommended. I also heard a couple of other people, unrelated to one another, mention that they were just uh, enthralled with this book. The name is Three Junes, and it's written by a woman named Julia Glass, who was awarded the 2000 New York Foundation for the Arts Fellowship in Fiction Writing. I don't know her, I hadn't read anything by her before, but this really is a wonderful book. The concept of the book is it takes place in Scotland, and it takes place over a 10-year period from 1989 to 1999. And the, um, the setting starts in 89, it goes to 95, and then to 99, and it takes place in June of each of those years. And it's told from a variety of uh, family points of view, but the story starts um, um, in Scotland with a man who is, uh, has just lost his wife, and he travels to Greece, and while he's in Greece, he meets a beautiful young artist, and he falls in love with her. Well, he's probably more infatuated with her. And uh, the story keeps flipping back to the incidents uh, leading up to his wife's death. And so that's very rich and very interesting, and um, there's a lot of family interaction with three sons. Well, you drop, jump forward to 1995, and the story then is told by his son Fenno, who is an expatriate in New York City who runs a bookstore, and he is also gay. And he tells his version of going back to Scotland <laughs> to be at his mother's funeral and goes through all of those family tragedies, and then he goes back again to be at his father's funeral. And um, then the story jumps forward one more time to June of 1999, and it's interesting how this story all layers together because the artist his father fell in love with in Greece is now at a dinner party with Fenno in 1999. They, they don't know it, but they're going to meet. And I won't tell you any more than that, but the story is beautifully written and uh, so richly layered because people keep meeting one another that unexpectedly is so uh, uh, great you know, story. So many of our viewers get very interested in this, and they, if I get in touch with Denise Clark and Denise and me, I'm gonna have you give them a telephone number, let them get a pen because you're the person to contact when they <laughs> want to pursue these books, but they also like to see the style of writing, a lot of our viewers, so I believe you can read a passage from this one, um, Well, sure, I hadn't planned, oh yeah, I had planned a passage from here. Um, this is from the first June, and uh, the main character, Paul McLeod, is at this time recalling a time when he was at home with his wife, and she was an avid um, um, raiser of collies. I mean, she breeded collies, and um, she was a very strong woman. Her sons all loved her dearly, uh, but she wasn't the housewife. She wasn't the perfect housewife, and and so they were all used to her getting up in the middle of the night and doing, uh, sitting with uh, a bitch who would be ready to um, give birth, and so. Paul is in bed, and he's, he's remembering this. He's in bed, and he wants her to come to bed, so he walks down the stairs, and here's what he sees. Maureen stood at the scullery sink. She jumped when he said her name. Paul, it's past two. She looked at him over her shoulder, but did not turn around. He could see the red glow of the heat lamp over the whelping box where Betsy nosed among the indistinct creatures that shivered and writhed between her legs. Good girl there, Bets, he said. Betsy did not thrash her tail to greet him as usual, but stiffened and warned him away with her eyes. Let her be, whispered Maureen. She's had a hard time, thirteen altogether. Paul came up behind her. Under his hands, her body felt like a barricade of muscle. There was a pail of, pink, of pinkish water in the sink. She held her hands under the surface and did not move when Paul touched her. 
He stepped back when she pulled her hands out of the pail. He thought she was washing them, but she held in each one a newborn black puppy. She laid their bodies on the drain board. A Mongol, she said as she emptied the pail down the drain. And this one, too, no tail. No tail? Why kill that one? You could have found it a home. Paul, Paul, she spoke soothingly as if he were one of the boys acting up over a lost toy. Something else is bound to go wrong with it. You can't be soft. <laughs> <laughs> oh my, she is strong, isn't yeah, she? Yeah. But it's, it, I'm always amazed at the, the powerful way the language is used by writers. It's just a, mm. a special, special gift. And Annie, you have some books, and uh, what I you have share. A, I have a couple ones. I, I wanted to just hear Fran read some more. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, also, I was to tell you that uh, Denise is compiling this list of books, and so if the re, you know the people are out there feverishly writing things down and saying, "Hold that book up a little bit more," that she actually will compile it, and I think and it'll be connected into the website. It'll be on the public forums website. Okay, we'll get back to that in a moment. Yeah. Well, thank you for doing that. <laughs> You're yeah. so sensitive to our viewers, which we appreciate. Yeah, this one too. Go back to Denise. So this kind of go, comes full circle, and this one was one that Denise recommended uh, probably about last January, because I've actually I noticed that I've checked it out of the library a couple times, and. The first time, uh, it's called The Crimson Petal and the White. And as you see, it's a little bit thick. So that's why I checked it out the first time, checked it out again, and right made now. it in the yeah. summer yeah. reading list. Yes, yes. And then I just got really hooked on it. And this takes place in about the, I'd say the late 1800s. And it's a story of Sugar, who is a prostitute in London and her life. And again, it has all sorts of, all sorts of complications here. Uh, what I thought was fascinating about it, it kind of has also kind of the flavor a little bit of the dress lodger that I'm not mm -hmm. going to tell you who the author is, but the um, levels of prostitution in London at the time. That if you lived at a certain address that you never did, that was one level. And, and Sugar is considered one of the higher prostitutes. And there's actually was a book in London that explains all the different, you know, you could go and you could kind of look through. It's a gentleman's guide to prostitution, I think was one of the, that's kind of a paraphrase. But it would say, you know, this if what houses had what women in it and stuff, and Sugar was quite popular. Well, she eventually becomes the uh, sole uh, prostitute or whatever for a man who uh, just is just fascinated with her, wants him all to herself, puts her in an apartment, and then later actually has her as the um, governess to his child and stuff. So, and then this, I like his writing. It, it like history, like many, many of them mentioned, the different history and how to learn about history and about that time. But also this writer has kind of an interesting way of writing that uh, I was talking about earlier about reading something and after a while saying, but it's a long description. Well, in this book, you'd be reading along and pretty soon the author would say, I am sure you're tired of hearing about this guy, and you know, so let's just go on to hear somebody else. Or who should we follow? Should we go with Betsy? No, Betsy's just going to have a headache. That'll be a boring story. Let's go follow Penelope. You know, and so it's just kind of really reader friendly. So I really enjoyed that one. And then the second one, which is, takes place in modern times, is The Empire Falls by Richard Russo. And uh, one of his other famous books that most people, a lot of people have read, is The Straight Man. It's made the rounds here at NIC. There's quite a few we, we enjoy. And, and this takes place in Empire Falls is the name of the city. And it also, again, rich with different characters and a, and a main character that you are pulling forward, what they always say, good literature, that the characters change over the time. And in, this, in both Crimson and this one, they change. And there's a couple of characters in Crimson they actually change from you like them at the beginning and you don't like them at the end. And it's the same thing with this one. And, it's a very good book. Do you know. have a passage you'd like to read from one of those? I or? don't have a passage. Okay. Uh, one, one of you, you I know Denise it's or Virginia? Because I just think Go those ahead, passages are really a great illustration. Yeah. Okay, and then we'll come back to okay. Frank. Well, I, I don't know if this is qualifies as fiction or nonfiction, but I uh, also want to recommend Billy Collins, who is the current Poet Laureate of the United States. And he is just the most approachable poet. I had the joy of hearing him at Whitworth College last spring. And my husband, who is a mechanical engineer, who will kill me for telling this, but isn't really a fond of poetry. But when he started reading Billy Collins, he said, well, why didn't you take me to hear him? <laughs> and I rolled my eyes and just what a said, compliment. next yeah. time. Yeah. But I thought I would just read part of a poem called Forgetfulness, because it's so appropriate to some of us who are getting a little gray around the edges. Mm -hmm. And it's also book-oriented, so I'll just read part of it. 
The name of the author is the first to go, followed obediently by the title, the plot, the heartbreaking conclusion, the entire novel which suddenly becomes one you have never read, never even heard of, as if one by one the memories you used to harbor decided to retire to the southern hemisphere of the brain, to a little fishing village where there are no phones. Long ago you kissed the names of the nine muses goodbye and watched the quadratic equation pack its bag, and even now as you memorize the order of the planets, something else is slipping away, a state flower perhaps, the address of an uncle, the capital of Paraguay. Whatever it is you are struggling to remember is not poised on the tip of your tongue, not even lurking in some obscure corner of your spleen. It has floated away down a dark mythological river whose name begins with an L, as far as you can recall, well on your own way to oblivion where you will join those who have even forgotten how to swim and how to ride a bicycle. No wonder you rise in the middle of the night to look up the date of a famous battle in a book on war. No wonder the moon in the window seems to have drifted out of a love poem that you used to know by heart. <laughs> How Some of us such know talent this. <laughs> to describe forgetfulness. And Fran, we'll come back to you. And you have another mine's, book there. Mine's a nonfiction. Oh, okay, we'll do so, that on the next okay. program. Denise, you have? I, well, I'd like to pick up with Maisie Dobbs one more sure. time because there are a couple of things I'd like to mention about this book. Jacqueline Winspear is British, and she moved to the States just fairly recently, within the last year or two. Uh, and this is her first novel, and, and Maisie is an investi investigator. After World War I, she sets up an investigative office, and of course one of the plot lines in this is that she does have a mystery that she must solve. Now, one of the things I want to let people know is that Maisie Dobbs will be a series. We can expect more Maisie Dobbs from Jacqueline Winspear. So this is the first in a projected Maisie Dobbs series. So if you love the first one, look for you know, <laughs> coming attractions. Uh, she'll be very pleased if she did. <laughs> <Yes. that. laughs> um, and, and before we go any further on this, I Annie was so good to say that we were going to do this. You are preparing the list of these books and maybe some others that for our viewers who love to read yes. and, and get a recommendation from us. And yes. so uh, they can get that on our website if you'll give that to yes, them. Yes, sh uh, the list should be posted at www.nic.edu um, forward slash public forum. And there will be a list of books there. In addition to that, some people just have to talk with you, Denise. So let's give them a telephone number. We're area code 208. Oh, absolutely, 208-769-3254. Let's do that one more time. 208-769-3254. Um, Thank you. We love our viewers to be able to get in touch with uh, what you're doing. My next question is, uh, and again, we have other many books that we couldn't talk about today, and, and 30 minutes is a short period of time, but, um, and I've asked this question before, but we always have some new viewers. Uh, one, you're all very busy. You're full-time at North Idaho College, and uh, many of you are teaching lots of courses and you have families, you have other responsibilities. What is your secret to reading so much? I, I'll start with Denise because I know her habits and, uh, <laughs> and she shows, but, and others of you may be different, but uh, Denise, tell them about how you find so much time, <laughs> even in the busy schedule, to read so many books. Uh, well, I have a book in every room. Uh, first, <laughs> I'm usually reading about four or five different books at once. And I have one in the kitchen. So when you're cooking. So when I'm cooking, you know, I'll have it under my nose while I'm stirring a pot. And burn things from time to time. Absolutely. And I make sure it's a paperback that I've paid for because invariably it will have splotches of food all over it. And so, and I have, I have books in the TV room, books in the living room, books in the bedroom. I mean, they're spread all over. So wherever I'm, you know, located, if I have a few minutes and I read, and I have to admit, I'm not much of a TV person. I, I grew up without a television set when I was a child, so I started reading at an early age. TV doesn't have the... But, but if you just read a, a, a little short period of time each day in each of those, you'll get through oh, a lot of books in a year. Absolutely. Fran, what method do you use? Well, <clears throat> I find it interesting that, that Denise says she's not a TV person because I'm not either. Um, Maybe a lot of uh, extensive readers aren't. <laughs> I don't. Uh, I don't know. I mean, it's not that I don't watch TV. But, but you do watch public television of for course. this program. Of course. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I go to bed early, 
it's it's um, it's interesting. Reading is kind of my private time, okay. and while the boys are downstairs watching TV, I'll go up and I'll snuggle up in my bed with the covers up, and I'll read for maybe two hours, mm -hmm. um, as much as I can get in, and I never miss it. It's like my balm. It's the reason to live in a lot of ways. And, and so you get a I, lot in a year, you'll get a lot of things that you've read. Oh, absolutely. I read constantly, all the time, uh, as much as I can fit in. Annie? Um, I'm kind of, I just work in, and people always say that, how can you, I average about a book a week, and people always say that, how can you get that much reading in? And it is, it's just, I, you know, it's kind of like you schedule exercise, you schedule eating, you schedule your reading, and I just used to start reading about 8 o'clock at night, and read till about 10.30. And um, I was sure just a quick story. This summer we went on a bike ride and we were carrying our own stuff. And of course, I had to like diligently figure out what paperbacks I was going to carry. And my fellow traveling companions made fun of me, saying you know, I was wasting space on books. And I would tear them apart as I went. But my mother, who's 93, who started uh, reading to me when I was six months old, she said, she goes, well, of course, they didn't expect you to actually go somewhere without books. <laughs> well, great story. And Virginia? Well, I have to admit that I do watch television, and um, I'm addicted to some shows. Uh, I have a satellite dish, so I have, unfortunately, too many choices, but um, I love the uh, Discovery Channel. But I always have a book during the commercials, and I mute the commercials, and then I read. <laughs> but I have my sacred time in the bathtub, <laughs> and I have my sacred time on the weekends especially, and I carry a book everywhere. My mm -hmm. purse always, I have to have a big purse because I always have a book in it. And I discovered that there are lots of times in your life when you have to sit and wait at the doctor's office or in the grocery line or somewhere or a, where a you can, on the flight, that you just have a book. And um, I'm like Denise, though, I have books in different parts of the house, too. Yeah. So I can sit in one room and be reading one and then pick up another one in the kitchen or whatever. On that note, I have to bring the program to a conclusion, but the great news is you're back next week, all four of you, and we're going to talk about uh, outstanding nonfiction books that you've read. It is always a delight to have you here. It's just so energizing, and you're also a great illustration of why North Dakota College is ranked so high in quality instruction and, and, uh, and pursuing knowledge because you are certainly great examples for your students and for the communities in general. And with that, we thank you and, ha and welcome you back again next week. Until then, ladies and gentlemen, we would wish you a very good week. Uh, I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, Public Forum is the longest running in-house college production on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station.